actually creating clothing that fits you well is such a crucial part. We have a culture where people have something that fits them really, really well, and then you wear it over and over again. It's comfortable, you love mm -hmm. it. All your clothes should be that way. I was really excited to start with solving the problem. By the time that I had sort of the idea for Sojo during uni, I started the day after. Every single Every business. single one. Every single one is a shit show. So I really was like, I have no idea what I'm doing. This is not going well. I didn't really know how to hire. I hadn't done it before. It's so emotionally taxing. It was really just like nothing like I'd prepared for. Well, this is where we'll maybe get a bit truthful. <laughs> I'm just gonna dive straight in. Really? As in like, okay, just there's, no, there's no countdown. There's no let's countdown. Go. I'll be doing the intro after. Oh, fine. Oh, so it's question one, let's go. Yeah. <laughs> it's, you're let's acting go. like it's an exam. Let's fucking go. <laughs> fucking go. <laughs> so, I wanna know about your career history and your background to get to where you are now, because it's so different for everyone. And it'd be really helpful for everyone listening if you could just say, whistle stop tour, mm -hmm. how you got to where you are now. I find it funny that this is the first question um, because anytime I do an intro call with anyone I meet, they do their career history and then you flip it over and you do your right, five minute yeah. intro. And I basically say, uh, university, and then the day I finished, started Sojo. So really? that's, that's, that's the end of that career history. Um, no, I'm joking. I mean, uh, throughout my teenage years, I was a tutor, nanny, and waitress. Yeah. And then during uni, I um, did an internship at Depop. And that, I suppose, is the most crucial bit of information yeah. here. Because I got into sustainable fashion, did an internship at Depop, kind of learned that you could, that's when I learned about what a startup was actually. And I was like, wow, you can start something yourself. It's circular, it's cool, it's different. The culture was great. Um, and then by the time that I had sort of the idea for Sojo during uni, I started the day after. Um, so yeah. And do you think that you had this kind of idea that you would be a good entrepreneur or yeah. was it kind of this do you think you'd be good um <laughs> or was it kind of in your head just actually I want to make the specific idea happen so kind of let's put one foot in front of the other and try and make it work maybe it makes it both mm -hmm. I feel like um I maybe always knew that I probably wouldn't be good working for someone else right okay yeah um Mainly because I just don't want to. <laughs> I have no Because I don't want to. But also, like, even maybe... Uh, I just have an issue sometimes with maybe management of myself. Um, mm -hmm. So that's maybe a problem. Like, even when... Actually, even when I was at Depop, like, I just... You know, I sometimes have some issues. Um, you know, being, you know, managed by men, for example. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Um, so, like, definitely wanted to be my own boss. Think that was just there as an underlying thing. My dad started his own company. So, like, you see oh, that. Oh, amazing. So, you kind of been around that. Exactly. Um, but I wouldn't say that I was, like, I'm going to be a startup founder that's going to do X, Y, and Z. I think I was really excited to start with solving the problem. And actually, I was really skeptical about the whole startup space. I was really, like, mm, don't like what's going on there. Like, I didn't really like the culture. I was really sort of skeptical about the investment landscape and you know I've got to stop talking about men but the men that are in it <laughs> um and I basically was just like yeah I'm gonna do this I'm gonna start this and in my mind I actually was like maybe I'll end up being like this bank founder you know build a billion dollar company with yeah. zero investment that was maybe me at the beginning um and then you know you learn that actually there are some amazing investors out there <laughs> you have to say that for context I've invested <laughs> Wait, <in> yeah. <laughs> including great no for real like I wouldn't have seen this as like the investor who I, who would be investing in me um but like incredible like love love my investors and it's like so like learning about the actual space and the people and the niches and like the support that can be out there changed my mindset entirely and like now definitely gonna still build that billion dollar company mm -hmm. but with some help along the way yeah yeah no absolutely and I think that um, I've talked about it before on kind of this podcast and talked also from an investor's perspective mm -hmm. and I think that we do have this kind of really clear idea of what investment mm -hmm. looks like and it is this terrifying like mm -hmm. big Silicon Valley like having to grow at insane speed all of these things and there are actually so many different types of investment that are right for so many different types of company mm -hmm. um but I'd really love to know kind of from the beginning, what was the original idea for Sojo? Like when you thought of mm. when people were saying, oh, what are you doing after university? And you were saying, oh, I'm actually studying my own thing. Yeah. How would you describe the concept to them back then? Yeah, I think what's also funny here is I remember someone being like, how's that sewing business going? And it's just funny because at the time it was confusing to explain it because 
you do immediately get categorized as like maybe right. a sewer. Yeah. Um, and equally, even when I did one of my first interviews, they were like, we'd really like to see you sewing. And I was like, you're kind of missing the point mm. of me being a tech founder. Hmm. Anyway, so the idea right at the beginning and the problem right at the beginning was the fact that I was really into secondhand clothing mm -hmm. and I was constantly finding pieces which you do, that you love, that aren't your size. And like, there's only one size when it comes to secondhand clothes. You'd find mm -hmm. an amazing pair of trousers, vintage, great style, get great price. What are the chances? It's your exact mm -hmm. waist and hip and length. So I was like, hmm, we should be able to fit these to us. And like, that will encourage more circular shopping. Um, but when I went to take it to the tailor, it was uh, really backward and archaic. And like, it was just cash only. Um, it was, you know, get dressed behind this like plastic curtain where I felt a bit uncomfortable, come back in five days. I went back two months later because it was just I sat on my to-do list and I was like, this whole process needs to be modernized. Mm -hmm. There's no way this sector that hasn't been changed since the 1800s is meant to be here for the 21st century. It's so interesting as well because I don't think, or I don't know anyone really within our kind of generation. Like none of my friends are like, I, I always say, for example, my jeans only fit because I get them tailored. People always okay, ask, hello. people always, always ask, mm. where are those jeans from? They fit so mm. well. And I'm like, the chances of you finding a non-stretchy item of clothing that you're gonna put on and it being to your measurements. Mm. Like I know, because obviously mm. I work in fashion, I know the way we fit is on a fit model, which is essentially a human mannequin. And it's based on average quote unquote proportions for each size and the chances like, we all know that's, that we don't have average proportions. It sounds, it's, it's, it's insane. It's crazy, but that's what we say. Like, clothes are made in binary sizing, mm -hmm. and people are not. Very like, different. I mean, every, if, every single part of us will be different. It's crazy. And if you look at your friend that might be the exact same size as you, chances are they look completely different mm. to you. So I okay. think that what's really interesting is, like, we have this love of clothing and obsession with this kind of, you know, as we'll, we'll kind of, like, talk about, there's probably quite problematic obsession mm. with you know consumerism and and consuming fashion and the fact that we don't have higher standards of how well it fits us or how long it lasts or like any of these things is actually a bit insane when you think about it because you know I look at the pieces in my wardrobe that I've had for years like my really good quality jeans that I just spent probably double what I would have spent on mm. say if I bought fast fashion jeans and they've literally lasted me about five years and a good pair of jeans is never going to change mm. like mm. it's really not going to change what suits you what fits you all of this and it, it's insane how we as a generation actually have no idea about tailoring really like where to go what how much it costs it's not part of the culture it's not part of the culture at all and I also think we're one generation removed from when our parents would even do it because I know mm. I don't know about you well mm. I don't know maybe your parents do, would <laughs> do like to, like kind of like alter something but my no <laughs> no I, I would be so shocked <laughs> I'd probably drop dead if I walked in on my mum altering a piece of clothing my mum has no idea how to yeah. sew that's it it's just it's so not part of the culture whatsoever, but it's so critical to an industry where clothes are in one size and people aren't. And I think also we have a culture where people have something that fits them really, really well. And then you wear it over and over again. It's comfortable. You love mm -hmm. it. All your clothes should be that way. Mm -hmm. Otherwise you have a pair of jeans that you don't like the way it's too tight. And, and you never like reach for them. Exactly. You never would. And so actually creating clothing that fits you well is such a crucial part for longevity of that item your relationship with that item and like also understanding that you can change the clothes mm. as you change as well so like it shouldn't be that you're one size and then that's it for your wardrobe it's like if you change size those clothes should change with you yeah and really interestingly I often think about this in a way too that I think I'm the age that probably didn't even grow up with the high street as in I mm. you know would meet my friends at Topshop and all of this but by the time I actually had money to spend everything was mm. online mm. it was all boohoo plt like all of these ones that suddenly popped up um and so i actually think that as me and my friends i don't think we ever had a high standard for our clothing and i think then when older generations talk about like oh but you know investing in something that lasts or we would only buy this much or any of these things it's like i actually don't think i ever had a piece of clothing that i intended to mm. last for years just as a teenager before I knew about sustainable fashion any of these things mm. it wouldn't be seen that way so it's kind of it's a whole different culture in itself but big, bigger conversations and I'm sure we'll come on to them <laughs> but the uh, the kind Ten of later <laughs> yeah exactly the the concept of sojo then was it the this kind of delivery for tailoring or was it did it kind of take time to kind of go in that direction and then go to where you are now um what was that what did that look like at that time when you first started putting the bare bones of the business together? Yeah, so it actually did. It really was thinking about like, 
creating a way where someone could book it on an app really easily that gets picked up and dropped off because hyper convenience mm-hmm. and also loved the kind of hyper local marketplace tailoring model. Um, and that's why it was made akin to kind of delivery of clothing alterations and repairs. However, that has really changed mm-hmm. over the whole course of, you know, we'll get there. <laughs> the whole course of the last sort of 18 months. Um, but that is how it started. And that worked. The reception was really really great and immediate and that was really surprising um mainly because you yeah as you say you're meant to iterate mvp after mvp but actually the solution that was put out there people using and coming back and using again amazing and that's so that's almost really quite rare to especially strike really get that spot on that your original concept is actually right especially if it's one that requires a bit of a cultural thought mm. change. Which investors hate. Which, when you yeah, say exactly. That, I literally, like, I'm there being like, so we need to change consumer behavior. And they're like, they're like that's, a, that's a big <laughs> thing. Could you not just, like, just put something you already know in the post? <laughs> like, that would be great. Um, and so how did you build the initial tech? Yeah, so right at the beginning, um, I was looking for a co-founder for quite a long time. Mm-hmm. Uh, was really like, I would love a black female software engineer. That yeah. was the criteria. Went to a whole load of events. Did I find them? No. Um, And also, actually, what I realized is it's not just that category. It's like black female software engineer into sustainable fashion, has the means to start something up and not have a salary, wants to be in the startup land. Yeah. I really was like, huh, no wonder after a few months. And then... (laughs) And no wonder so many white co-founders are found all the time in terms of like it's going to be then biased in terms of people here in the same way as you can only take an unpaid internship if you can live Mm -hmm. in a city your parents can support you any of these different things Mm -hmm. it's like no wonder the space skews more and more in the direction of um you know yeah like middle class and kind of like very much able to kind of be supported and all of that yeah completely and then and then um my dad spoke to me and he was just like what are you doing you've got this idea, you're sitting on it, get started yourself. Um, and so I started asking around for any and all software engineers, didn't really have a network of them. Um, and then a friend of a friend of a friend's boyfriend okay, good. was a software engineer mm-hmm. and his friend coded the Soja app. <laughs> so basically put, it put us in touch um, with actually a couple of engineers, both recent graduates, both wanted to build something, have experience. Um, and Isaac, who is now a full-time engineer at Sojo, he uh, had a job that he was starting that had sort of six weeks before then. And he was like, yeah, we'd love to take on this project. We'd love to do it. Um, and yeah, the rest is history now. We're sort of, it's our two year anniversary working together last week. Um, which Amazing. Is super exciting. And I, I know the concept has gone through many iterations since then. I think we, we, when we talk about the idea of an MVP, mm. this kind of minimum viable product that you want to get out there, this is exactly what it's for. It's the idea mm. that it might work, mm. people might love it, all of this, but it might not be scalable. Mm. It might not be able to be profitable, any of these different things. Um, and you, I know you've moved more to a kind of B2B type model. Mm. How did you start noticing that a shift was needed in the model? And then how did you make that change? Yeah, so that shift came as it, I think, should from like market demand. Um, And by that, I mean last year. So um, Isaac did join his other company um, and that meant that full time team of Sojo was just me. And basically it was me, the beta app out in the market. And we had inbounds from billion dollar fashion brands, like huge household names big, big, big companies. And it would be me on like a meeting with like four of them. And they'd be like, so do you have a tailoring and repair solution for brands? And I was like, huh. Cause like we were just, <laughs> we were just, you know, doing our thing. Um, I was cycling some shifts still sometimes. And I was a bit like, like honestly, like all the, a lot of brands that you would know. Um, and I was just like, if they are coming and talking to this bitch, uh, it means that there's no one in the market serving them in the way mm-hmm. they need to, otherwise they wouldn't be here. Yeah. Um, so then I was like, right, if we do do that, it actually means, and I had a conversation with an investor and they were like, you can spend 10 years acquiring 10 million customers by spending 10 million pounds, or you can secure a great partnership and you get 10 million customers overnight. And I was like, wow, hmm, that sounds <laughs> yeah. amazing, B2B. Um, so kind of realized that actually in terms of scale and impact and changing customer behavior through a means where they already know a brand and if we facilitate repairs for them, it's paid for, it's pushed by the brand, they have that community, it kind of was a no brainer. Um, and so started, yeah, skewing our business model towards that. And how did you start changing the tech for that? How did you kind of solidify the idea? Was that the point that you needed to kind of get investment to be able to change the idea? Yes and no. Um, so actually, like when we raised investment at the tail end of last summer, which was an angel round where I originally wanted to go out and raise 100 and we raised 300, that was actually still with the direct to consumer app proposition. Mm-hmm. Um, but then quite quickly after that was when the B2B stuff started being like, actually, this is where we're going to skew. And the tech wise, 
we made the problem, as you do when you're building tech and doing things for the first time, we uh, launched a partnership with Gani at the end of last year and bespoke tech. We weren't thinking about it in a modular, scalable way about other brands. It was really like, what can we build for them as quickly as we can build it? Scrappy, scrappy, scrappy. Um, and then put that out there. And we've since learned what we're building for scale um, and have sort of been developing that. And so if you go on Gani yeah. and you're checking out with something and you want to get it tailored, how does the Sojo solution work? Yep, so this actually is a big learning from the Gani partnership to where we're at now. Um, but essentially with Gani, it was like a post-purchase portal. So essentially right. after you bought it, you can go there and you can put your order number in and you can say I want, and it pulls your order history and you can say I want them shortened. It's totally free. Gani pays for it, amazing. Um, and we come, it connects to our back and we pick it up from your house and we drop it back to you three to five days later, shortened. Wow. Yeah, amazing, in theory. <laughs> yeah. Really great. Uh, problem is, is actually because it was post-purchase and not part of the customer journey, we were reliant on marketing teams for pushing it. Mm -hmm. And that means if they push it, we get people using it. If they don't, we don't get orders. Because um, it's a change of customer behavior as yeah. well. So, yeah, so ultimately if they're driving people to booking, then fine. But if they're not, they're not. And so actually that's shifted what we're doing so that we want to be... We want to make tailoring repair part of a customer purchase journey. So it's part of why when you're buying, you're thinking about fit and you're thinking about longevity. Mm -hmm. That's so interesting. And when getting this inbound conversation mm. from Gani, how on earth did you have the confidence to just be like, <laughs> okay, we've been doing DC. This big company with all of these customers has asked us to do with this. Yeah, of course we could do that. Let's yeah. just let's just go and do that. Yeah, I think it's um I don't know, I feel like every single entrepreneur is fake it till you make it energy. Yeah. I mean everyone. I mean sometimes it goes terribly wrong with like um Theranos and stuff, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> a bit too much faking it, I would yeah, say there, maybe. A bit too much, but the whole point is we all do it. Yeah. And so this notion of being like, yeah, 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 because I loved Gani. And I sort of was like, yeah, definitely want to do it. hundred percent, let's go. Um we'll it, just make it work. Yeah, we'll just make it work and lo and behold, we did ish. Um and I think then you get a chance to step back and be like, how are we really gonna make this work? Um and that's actually from that premise and the learnings from Gani, that's what we raised our pre-seed, our big sort of institutional pre-seed off the back of from learnings, which is just always what you do. You like put mm. something out there, see what goes wrong, decide to do something different and then get money for it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it is so, I think we always see this idea of like a startup as a pretty strict concept that's going to, mm -hmm. you know, that's going to be what you originally pitched and yeah. it's going to make what you originally said and like all of these different things. Oh and actually, God. I think it takes so much strength to actually just completely ignore yourself and listen to the customer data. Mm. And it's not just about ignoring yourself because it, usually customer data will push you in a direction. Then you're like, that makes so much sense. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you guys for letting me know. Like really appreciate that. Um, but it's still tough to be able to mm. say kind of, oh no, but I thought the original business model would be mm. this. Like for an example from my side is that Shreddy, the most successful original products were PDFs mm. and then it went to physical product. And I really then thought the physical product was going to be it. Like that it was a physical product mm. business. Then when we released our app, because the way that apps work, it was about like 85% profitable as a part of the business. There's obviously <laughs> kind of- Subscription based Yeah, it's well. subscription based. Mm. You can rely, you can forecast really easily. Um, you, in terms of the actual running costs, it's only really the developers, like all of this. And just got, I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> that business is entirely different kind of from what I expected. Yeah. And if you keep trying to push one thing mm -hmm. when other, when mm. the customer's data is saying different things, then you're just going to get completely mm. swept away. And I think that's what's one of the most important things about having, not rushing this, uh, rush the idea of an MVP, because mm. as soon as you can get anything out there and that points you in the direction, great. But not rushing like the company evolution and also not being static in it just because you think you have this really great idea and you think it's going to work. It could work, but mm. it could also need a billion pounds of investment to work. <laughs> and ultimately, so if you can do something less to be able to, or mm. not less, but different to be able to get there, that can obviously be hugely effective. Um, and how many team members is Sojo now? Like, what does the company look like? What does the day-to-day -day look like? Well, this is where we'll maybe get a bit truthful. <laughs> yeah, no person. So like raised our round. Um, and then this is actually, I suppose, when you have an idea of how things are gonna go. Mentally, I was like, yeah, raise the round, hire our team, six mm -hmm. weeks, find an amazing team, live our life, um, and then get started. And I just, I completely ad admittedly, I got the whole hiring process totally wrong, obviously, because mm -hmm. I'd never done it before. Yeah. Um, and, you know, ended our round and it was me and Isaac still. 
team of two. Um, and then I was like hiring for 11 roles, putting out on LinkedIn, actually got like hundreds of applications. We got over 300 applications. Amazing. Um, and I was then dually operating the business doing everything and then also trying to hire. Um, didn't really know how to hire, hadn't done it before, didn't have the structure, didn't really know what processes people go through. Tried to listen to some podcasts, didn't really have the time, um, and it was absolute chaos. However, however, took that learning from those kind of six, seven weeks, ended up being in a place where I really was like, I have no idea what I'm doing, this is not going well, and kind of had some leads and they didn't fall through, they, they fell through and it was a really chaotic time. And I think actually taking the control and being like, okay, what actually maybe I should have decided is post fundraise, I'm allowed to go into some kind of the stealth mode mm -hmm. where like I take the learnings from the 18 months, we're changing our operational model, we need to build a team, let's calm things down. Like right. I don't, it, there doesn't need to be this pressure of I want month on month growth from four weeks after our fundraise because that's what I know these VCs are expecting. It's about understanding like building this team can be as slow as it needs to be because they are the foundations mm -hmm. for the entire future of this whole business. So I've started from scratch and then Currently, right now, we're a team of three, but we have about three or four really great hires that we're going to be closing in the next couple of weeks. Um, and over the next sort of few months, we'll hopefully be about a team of 10. That's really exciting. And I think that's so true, is that one of the biggest learnings I've had as well mm. is in terms of scaling, that we're very much scaling at the moment and including the team. Mm. And you, you just cannot magic hiring. You cannot just you magic the right person. And if you, mm. one of the biggest tips I've ever had in terms of hiring is if it's not a fuck yes, it's a no. And it's, it, you I say that honestly, in life. that's my mantra. Yeah, I mean, it's my a very mentality. good mantra <laughs> yeah. for life, unless you need to push yourself out there a bit more. Um, but I feel like in general, it is so true. Every single time mm. it's not been a fuck yes, mm. it has ended up being a no. And it will cost you far more down mm. the line and I think that I you know I've had the exact same thing I think we've had many different phases of Tala and I think I absolutely love where we are now the most frustrating thing about where we are now for example this is one really crucial role that we have to get right and I refuse to get wrong because every time I've compromised on getting something right it, it's gone wrong yeah <laughs> um and so this person and I'm like no they have to be like this but you cannot magic the right person to be in the right place at the right time, oh. want to change jobs, have the exact balance of strategy versus creative, mm. be in the right salary bracket, want to maybe take a pay cut, like all of these things. The mm. chances are not very likely. Mm. And yet you kind of think, oh, we're going to put this job role out there and we're going to find the right person. And the biggest problem might be that we can't quite afford them or we have to really, whatever it might be. Mm. But hiring is, I think, one of the hardest but also the most important thing completely to get right but because also if you don't get that person in that role that whole vertical is staying stagnant which is what i had to realize and understand is like until we get the person in this role in this role in this role actually yes i can do bits and still do it bits myself whilst i'm still hiring but you want to see that excelling like you're ready for that role to be in and things to move forward but you don't want to get it wrong and i can't stress enough and I don't know how whether you feel the same but for me I cannot stress enough how much this entire post investment process and this has been us post revenue right so mm. we were two and a half years post revenue mm. when we raised yeah, so did. that's very yeah. different <laughs> but even that it the most accurate description is building the rocket ship while you're in it yeah. Like, because you're you're <laughs> trying so to work true. out, like, well, if we get the engine going, that's great, but we actually don't have the shell of the mm. ship, so we're actually going to fall apart. So we've got all of these inputs firing, but we don't have the customer here, or we have this, but we don't have this. Mm. And the chances of that all coming together Working. at once are so <laughs> tough. And yet, just every day, you're like, right, we need to do this, this, and this. And I think what you've said is so valid in terms of, actually, take it back. What mm. can we control yeah. over the next month? What we, what can we actually do? Whether we tick this box, this box, or this box, mm. no matter whether we do those, we will be able to do mm. X, Y, and Z. Mm. And I think that that's so important because we especially think post fundraise you need to go a million miles per hour. Exactly. And ultimately, it's a recipe for disaster if you're trying to go at a million miles per hour to impress investors that are going to be very unimpressed mm. when in six months just, <laughs> everything's shit yeah well that's the thing is i also took inspiration from fisaya you know from right yeah. active when they I put was, their yeah. pause out so i we have put a pause on our operations at sojo Amazing. to make these this hiring huge decision really was so tormented by the whole thing and i was like what are people going to say? What are customers going to say? What are investors going to say? But actually, when I like, sh I saw her do that last year or earlier this year, put a yeah. pause on things and was like, you know, we need to get some things right and we'll come back bigger and better. And I was like, that's exactly what I have 
the, I have the control to do that. This is ultimately, they've entrusted me with this money and I will get there in the end. This is what I need to understand needs to happen for six weeks so that I can just focus on hiring because it's so crucial. And it takes so much strength yeah. and it's also not Very the emotional. dumb thing. And mm, I think that I mean, we, a lot of, by the nature of like what gets press, the majority of entrepreneurship that we're going to see out there is going to be really highly funded and usually with people who've like grown businesses before. Yeah. So we wouldn't see taking a break as part of a post fundraise <laughs> like thing. I know. I don't or know. even as part of a business at all. There would have been so many times within Tala that we would have benefited so much mm. from just a break rejig for mm. a few months. And that was even once we, you know, it's a pretty simple model essentially it's a the only big problem really about ours is that it's much lower margin than most fashion mm. businesses because it has way too much demand exactly that's, that's exactly right. which is a great problem to have yeah, yeah, yeah. um but either like that's kind of with an even simpler business model so i can imagine for anything where these are, there are just these big existential questions about the business that come up again and again and you feel like every day you're just working in the business rather than on it mm. the only way you can get that time is by pausing and i think that so many more so many entrepreneurs would benefit from having the confidence and also the cash flow essentially yes, to be able to be. just be like stop we're planning this yeah. break, or we could plan this break for three months time, but at that point we mm. will be doing this break mm. and all of that time we'll be working, rebuilding, re-engineering and kind of coming back. Um, so how's the break been? It's been really good. Yeah? Yeah, I'm in a, the place that I was in pre-break, whereas it's like, it's so much, the operating, the, we've spoken, the rocket ship, now it's been really fantastic getting the time to focus on the hiring and the pipeline. I am so excited. The idea, it's the hell yes energy. It's like, all I want, people talk about entrepreneurs having issues with delegation. All I want is to delegate. Yeah. I'm literally like, I've done it. Like, yeah. I have been social media manager. I've been product manager. I've been this. I've been that. I've done the operations. I've done all of it. You, you have to. You are. Apart yeah. from engineering, which I have not done. <laughs> yeah. But I cannot tell you how much I'm excited to watch an expert who I know is a killer, 10 out of 10, because if it's not hell yes, it's a no, come in and me be like, fantastic yeah take it and you know what Smash you tell it. me what's yeah yeah exactly like, you tell me what's wrong Please. you tell me what's exactly. right i don't have Go the ahead. expertise like getting a you know getting someone in who like as much as i can i can do the sales i can get brands on board i can do the account management and do the organization piece there are people who that is their bread and butter they're incredible at it they're inc like they have been focused on that as their sole thing and that allows for that vertical to flourish and i'm just excited now for this next stage of really actually getting things out there with our brands that we're going to be working with, with the correct team. And I think that I'm feeling so motivated each day. Um, whereas like there are times when you're so stressed out, the post fundraise feeling, I think also there was just a lot of weight there as yeah. well with like getting money, which before you get it, it's hypothetical. Mm -hmm. So you're raising and you're like, this is, you know, one milli, like, yeah. you know, oh, yeah. yeah, two milli. Like you're just, you're there just like raising and then it hits and you're like, this is real, real, real. Um, and so there was just like a lot of mental stuff there, but suddenly like getting out this other side um, definitely helped by reading a certain book and like going to therapy and stuff but the perspective right now and the way I feel about the business is so positive not to be on a high horse or anything <laughs> no 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 that's perfect and also I think take those <laughs> I was about to sound so mean I was gonna say take those moments as they come because, because, because they'll because be gone tomorrow <laughs> yeah and you know what like I'm just gonna say mm. it like I think that's fantastic but I also I I go through every single week I'm either so on a high well, you're or a low. <laughs> and Wait, it's Grace, just... I know. No, no. I, I literally say peaks and troughs. And like, honestly, my poor therapist that I'll come in and either I am literally like, I'm healed. This is it. This is who I, I am. I love this. This challenge is perfect yeah. for me. <laughs> I was dancing down the street on my yeah. way here. Or I'm literally like... No, I will die. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I didn't want to say it, but I'm literally like... <laughs> yeah. No, no. So I make it. <laughs> so have you read um, Ben Horowitz, uh, The Hard Thing About Hard Things? No, but I want to. I would say, so listen to it on an audiobook, mm -hmm. whatever. I, I put it on an audiobook when I was going through a really, really hard time with the business. Mm -hmm. And I listened to it every day. I went on a walk and listened to it. It was the best thing I could have ever listened really? to at that time. And one of the parts of it, and it, it the best thing about it is it's this absolute shit show business story that's in like <laughs> silicon valley okay. or like in the u.s it's 
it doesn't feel like it, but it's much higher stakes. You know, they're talking about the fact that they're going out to do their, you know, they're about to list on the stock market and suddenly they're share, you know, like all okay. of these different things. Yes. And um, it did, really did make me feel better about like selling some leggings. But <laughs> ultimately, one of the things that has stuck with me most from that is he ex he describes entrepreneurship as the fact that it's either extreme, you you're basically either in euphoria or terror. And there's no so in between. True. And so true. both of them are exacerbated by lack of sleep. So like whether this is the whole concept okay. and it is the most mm. accurate thing mm. I have ever heard because I honestly, I mean, I am either on top of the world or I literally would not be surprised if I dropped down dead. And it is such a roller coaster. It's such a roller coaster. But it's, it's this feeling of, because you're putting yourself through probably the most intense flow state of this kind of mm. constantly working on something really hard, the euphoria you get when something just starts to work and the inputs start to equal the outputs mm. and all of this mm. is just off the mm. chain. Mm. And we the terror yeah. <laughs> when you think, do you know what? If this launch doesn't go as it should, we're three weeks away. Like we're three weeks away from running out. <laughs> like when you genuinely think that and you're like, and if I needed to tie myself to debt, I'd have to tie me. It's not the company. Mm. It's like all of these things. Mm. And you're just sitting there and you're just like, mm. oh. The only thing that makes me feel good in those states is hearing about other people feeling horrific. And that's really bad. But sometimes I'll literally message a founder friend to be like, how are things? And if they're like, yeah, things are going good. I'm like, never mind. Because all I want is to bond with someone over like the the depths of how, I'm like, it's, it, I, I feed off of it. If someone else relates, I'm literally like, thank you, this feeling. Because I think one of the biggest parts of that is that it's so unacceptable as an entrepreneur to be sharing that online. Imagine if I got on my story and I said, like, by the way, guys, we're a few weeks away from cash flow running out. But anyway, like, Buy the house leggings. <laughs> and like, usually it's love the case. Support. And obviously like we're, you know, we're fresh out of funding rounds. So like we're no longer in that position yeah. and all of that. But it can happen to Ed. It like, mm -hmm. I mean, it does. As a, also, I don't know about you, but dependent on business model, fashion very much does constantly run on nearly dying. Mm -hmm. So it's like, that's, mm. you know, that's a kind of like normal part of the puzzle. But I think, so I almost like refuse to network for a few years. Not because... Okay not for any reason other than the fact that I thought I should be working on the business and I didn't necessarily think that I should be sitting there meeting people uh, that, that like in my head makes sense to, to me looking back that was mm. the most stupid thing I could have done because it meant that two and a half years into having a business I had no idea that every single other business is an absolute shit show as well every and single so one. every single <laughs> every single one, one. Every Whether day. it's big, you know, you, you hear about your friends' jobs, you hear about all of this. Every single one. Every business, single one. Every single one. Is a shit show. Every single one. And I think that as an entrepreneur, if you're constantly only seeing what's online or the very selectively told, I'm having a really hard time because of X, Y, and Z, ultimately, you're not really going to talk about the depths of it online, are you? Because you can't and you probably shouldn't in front of customers and investors and all of this. But it's really, really, really mm. hard because mm. it means that it's so selective in terms of what's shared. Mm. The best I ever felt was when I started talking to entrepreneurs who were really honest and being like, oh yeah, no, honestly, if I mean, if we don't close this round tomorrow, then we're, t to be honest, we're pretty fucked. I'm surprised we haven't gone already. And like all of this, and you only hear about businesses going bust or big things That's happening, me. you know, and it's like the big ones and all of this, like you don't hear about it a lot of the time, but it mm. probably happens more than you even think mm. and you just won't even notice mm. and everything. And I think that that so it's such a selective view on entrepreneurship that then when you're in it, you never know what it's actually like. And I completely agree. Then the only way I've felt better is like within the past year, actually having entrepreneur friends yeah. and being like, hey, <laughs> can you tell me about how shit things are? I'm like, please share this with me. But that's the thing. I would have thought Tala was the exception it's to the great, rule. Guys. I literally am just... <laughs> There's not a single thing wrong ever. No, but like... <laughs> But even hearing you say that, I'm just like, even the queen herself. Thanks, babes. Mm -hmm. But honestly, yeah. it, it, Every, it's, everyone, every business. The function of yeah. a business working, if you're not a kind of profitable lifestyle business that churns along every day with the same systems. What a dream. What a dream. Why <laughs> what did a, I not? What a dream. <laughs> lifestyle business. I know. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to be out here starting a cafe. After this is done. <laughs> I know, and they'll be just as hard and it will be like, right. And they'll like, scale the cafe. Yeah, exactly. They'll scale <laughs> the cafe, cafe which I'm going to do. Um, but, but yeah, it's kind of, mm. every, 
if you're not in that kind of lifestyle business that chugs along on the same systems or agency that chugs along on the same systems or whatever it might be, mm. there are some really low lift businesses that would have been great ideas. Um, <laughs> if you're not one of those, you're constantly going to be pushing yourself to be working out the new formula. You think you've sorted one thing, suddenly it involves a few other problems. For ex an example for me is that we've been hiring loads over the past few months. We've had amazing people come on board. I've never felt so excited. I walk into the office every day thinking I'm in Devil Wears Prada as the edit editor of Vogue and I'm just having like the best, the time of my life. Oh, sorry, it was Mode magazine, wasn't it, not Vogue. Um, and, um, but one thing that that's exposed is the departments that are growing quicker than the others is meaning that the capacity of the business as a whole is hugely increasing mm. and it's meaning that the parts that we haven't mm. been able to hire fast enough for are really really struggling because everything's moving at pace mm. and then so for example I've spent this the whole past two weeks essentially trying to cover as many of those jobs as possible which is mm. definitely not what not even my expertise mm. like it's not even what I but it kind of you will be humbled violently every few weeks in entrepreneurship. <laughs> it's literally like, you thought you were able to delegate everything? <laughs> oh, here's a big old problem that only you can solve. Mm. Throws it on your plate and it's like, cancel everything for the next two weeks. Mm. And I think that's just the story of entrepreneurship. It is and what it is. It is what it is. And it also is terrible <laughs> sometimes. It's horrific. <laughs> but wouldn't do anything else. Because also one thing that I was like, the reason I hate myself is because if I did stop, and like part of me, you know, you get to those moments where you're like, could I send the money back? Uh, could I send How that money back? How do you feel about to those receiving accounts? this money? <laughs> so I was like, the if, same I, amount. if I did, and then I was like, and if I actually stopped, and I was like, whew, like that's done. Um, about two weeks later, I'd be like, all I want to do is be doing yeah. it again. It, that's what's crazy is like, you love it, you hate it, you love it, you hate it, and like I, I wouldn't do anything it's a else. Really it's toxic relationship. To me. I will it's say. so toxic. It's like an abusive relationship. But like I wouldn't do anything else. I'm like I'm I'm so excited to get to the good parts and then you're in the bad parts. And it's just yeah, it's fantastic, isn't it? We, <laughs> we love it. We absolutely love it. And now when you think of the kind of big dream for Sojo, mm. what is it? If you could paint where it would be in a few years mm. and it's like the ultimate dream, what does it look like? I think especially with this B2B SKU, our vision is that tailoring and repair is not only mainstream, but such an integral part of fashion culture mm -hmm. and such a done thing in all realms. So all brands are facilitating repair, all brands are facilitating tailoring. People understand, ultimately, like if we're going back to like root, root causes of what I envision, it's really a mental shift from people and how they think about fashion. It's them thinking this item should fit me well and it should last 20 years. And I know that's crazy big dream, but like I think Sojo, what we really wanna do is we wanna change the culture and we wanna enable people to do that in real practical ways. We wanna be unbelievably ambitious and we wanna say, this is exactly how you can do it and this is how you can engage and this is how we make it really easy and really affordable and cool as well. And it's, I just think that what I love, about, there's so many things I love about the idea, that's obviously why I invested, you being one of the big reasons, exactly. but also on top of that is the fact that Actually, as someone who, as I mentioned, kind of grew up with fast fashion culture as like mm. a no brainer. Yeah. Like, of Default. course, I would buy something from Topshop rather than buying something from, I don't know, even like <laughs> Uniqlo was, it yeah. seemed ridiculous to pay more for like basics or any of those things. But the idea that this kind of fast fashion versus either mid market or up at like kind of designer could be even better. Because not just paying for good, you're not just paying for good quality, but you're also getting something that's literally tailored to yourself. Mm. Like that's just such an added bonus. Mm. If I'm thinking of deciding to spend double on a basic, mm. I want it to last for years. Yeah. If I can also, if that also is fit perfectly to me, first of all, I'm going to change the entire way I think about clothes. Mm -hmm. I'm going to love them far more. They're made for me. The clothes I have tailored, I wear ten times more mm, and get them. so many more compliments on them. And I can fully see it being such a persuading factor of people moving away from fast fashion because when you really start to grow up as well and realize mm. that actually like, okay, I could get it, but also like I gave in, for example, last summer and bought some stuff from Zara and just like completely honestly was just like, mm. oh my God, this is lovely. I just love the design and yeah. I wish someone, you know, that was better quality and better ethics did it, but here I am. So sorry, please cancel me. Um, <laughs> but so bought them, loved them, a month later, the fucking threads are coming off. Mm. And it's like, I would rather pay mm. double for this and it actually be yeah. better. Yeah. And the idea that I could do that and it be tailored to myself is just 
really, really exciting. Mm. And it, it is so appealing and it really presents, it widens this gap between fast fashion and upmarket, which sounds like a bad thing, but actually is a good thing if that gap is based on the benefits you get from paying more. Because I can really understand why someone looks at something and is like, why am I paying double for essentially the same thing? Yeah. And if that's not just the same thing, it's better quality, lasts you longer, better ethics, and fits exactly to you. I mean, it becomes a real no-brainer. No-brainer, but controversial opinion, mm-hmm. Go. Um, which is actually something that I've been battling with internally with myself and Sojo in the relationship to Sojo, is actually thinking about facilitating repairs and do we or don't we facilitate those repairs for fast fashion. Right. And making the decision that actually, really, if we're thinking about impact and if they want to put the money where their mouth is, facilitating free repairs for fast fashion items when they, as you say, are the most likely to break and the most likely to go to landfill and the most likely to be the consumers who we need to change the mindsets of. Actually, if we want impact, that is something that, I'm not saying we're not doing it, but... It's, it's something that actually on the roadmap for Sojo, it's like repairs should be across the board. Yeah. No item should be going to landfill. And yeah. Exactly. And that's, I completely agree. And when, when I'm looking at similar kind of almost like moral dilemmas at Tala, mm. it's the exact same. It's what is our mission mm. and does it further that? Yeah. And for you, if your mission is making sure that fashion is more circular, people yeah. love their things more, it's less disposable. It's not about being like, Zara, I know, we I won't like, exactly. It. Well, no, but that's the thing. It's like we're in a culture where I really was like, obviously not, not even a conversation, not partnership, no nothing. But I'm like, are we here for impact? Are we yeah. here for changing minds? Are we here for the results? Which was why leads me into, and you've always just been like so real and such an inspiration when talking about these kinds of things. But when you spoke really openly about Tala being on ASOS, right? And yeah. you were like, hello impact like we want to change people's minds we want to be in the places where they can choose this alternative at the same price point and I was like thank you it needs to be said but it's it's exactly and I think it's exactly that and I think it's harder and harder when social social media things see things as black and white we can't is, talk. we're gonna start going down this rubble <laughs> but, but I think <laughs> no, that no, no. actually my whole idea mm. with Tala and the transparency at Tala is that if we make a decision, we should be able to talk about it. Mm. And if we don't feel like we can talk about it, it's because it wasn't the right decision. And that's been over the past, especially the, the past few months when we've kind of been scaling, mm. has been, you know, my idea with Tala is that I want to make sustainable activewear more accessible, full stop. That means that if you usually buy Gymshark or whatever, God, I named a company. <laughs> I was about to be like, hot <laughs> Okay. But if you usually buy that or a certain fast fashions activewear brand and you usually buy that and you decide that you're still going to consume the same, but you're going to buy a Tyler legging instead and therefore save X amount of water, recycle nine plastic bottles, blah, 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 all of the way down the supply chain, blah, 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 all, all, that those, uh, yeah, all those unimportant <laughs> all things, those but all the way down the supply chain where yeah. we make better decisions and we're really, really conscious about our decisions. Who are we to say that because you're still consuming a lot, you're not welcome in our better club? That's the whole point. Is yeah. It's about catching people at the beginning of their journey and providing for people further down their journey. And if we start... Gatekeeping. Gatekeeping that mm. to people who are mm. actually are further down. That's just saying the mass market can never be better. Because I will always say that sustainable fashion is an oxymoron. It is. Mm. Like, I'd say circularity is probably one of the only things mm. that really creates this, what is truly sustainable fashion. But I refuse to believe that we cannot make change via better options. All of the ways we've changed over the past few years by like suggesting people just use oat milk instead on, you know, when they get a coffee out or just bring a like coffee cup with you or like any of these Mm. tiny little changes. Of course, they're not making anywhere near as big a change as government regulation Mm. or like celebrities not taking their private jets anywhere or all of these things. (laughs) But honestly, the amount it will help when we're not asking, we're not asking for perfection. No. We're, we're not asking for we're one not. person to be perfect. No. We're asking for many, many people to be better. Yeah. And I think that when you're thinking of those questions, when you can really talk about it in that way, there's nothing to be scared of. Mm. And I also think that it's understanding that you're not going to be everyone's perfect company. If for a person, if someone who's really, really far down their sustainability journey uses Sojo and then stops using it because they don't like the fact you do that, they weren't your ideal customer. 
And I think that I think the same in the way that actually there are some people who will buy Patagonia and who will not buy Tala because mm. we're not as we're not sustainable enough for them. Mm. And that's so fine because we are trying to bridge this middle gap. Mm. We're trying to get people who usually buy fast fashion to move over further in the direction of better by providing something that is appealing to those customers at a mass market level. Mm. And I think that it really, really it gets Oh, there's the fucking fire alarm. One second. <laughs> oh, hello. It's my cancellation <laughs> ringing. Through the yeah, then being like, stop, <laughs> stop now. It's my PR yelling at me. <laughs> well, it will stop in one sec. We don't it's all need test. to go That's out in our towels. No, like, yeah, I know. Wait in, the, wait in the car park. <laughs> With the person oh from the God. motorcycle. <laughs> Reminding me of University of yeah, I, I don't remember the last time I heard a fire alarm. Jesus. I know. It's so annoying. Um, anyway, I'll continue. No, where's I? Should um, we have a playback? What was my last <laughs> sentence? Do you remember, Andy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you were saying very passionately. <laughs> okay, good. Glad everyone's listening. <laughs> the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Bridging the gap at Mass Market. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> Andy said playing Candy Crush. <laughs> um, but there will be people who are further down the sustainability journeys that we will not be right for. Mm. And that is absolutely fine because if we create this black and white like kind of landscape, there will only be a really good option or a not good option. And there needs to be, I never would have gone vegan if there wasn't pescatarianism, vegetarianism, sort of like all of these things. And you have to create those kind of mm, like steps. stepping stones. Mm. Um, and that also means that you're not always going to be everyone's perfect company. Mm. And you're not always going to make the right decisions. And I'm sure, you know, we've made so many of the wrong decisions, I'd say. Mm. But I also think that if you can sit there and say, this is why we made it. And this is why when all of us sat in a room discussing this, we chose this. And it's not, you know, it's not just black and white. And mm. this is the explanation. As long as you're transparent enough about that, someone can then make their own mind up about whether that's something they agree with or not. Mm. But the problem is, is well, the, the complete lack of transparency elsewhere that's like, no, we're doing this, accept it, bye. <laughs> Here's our press release. <laughs> I think with Sojo, like, I mean, again, investors absolutely hated this. Um, but the notion of like, actually, Sojo as a service that could potentially be an add-on to any and all clothing, whether that's second-hand clothing, swapped clothing, um, high-end clothing, lower-end clothing. What I like to say is everyone wears clothes and everyone needs clothes to fit them and last long in the end. Uh, so Sojo is for everyone. Yeah. That's the sentiment. And they were literally like, no, no, no who's we your need target, target market? market. <laughs> Please. Who's your early adopters? Which is fair. And, yeah. you know, we start somewhere. Um, but ultimately, that's the vision as well. It's like everyone, everyone and anyone fitting clothes to them and getting them repaired instead of throwing them away. And so your first big partnerships were the ones that really created a shift for you in terms of like the business moving towards B2B and the business starting scaling. Is that right? Or would you say that it was kind of the original consumers? No, no. So it was the brand partnerships. Uh, it was the brand, sorry. Um, but it was purely the conversations that created our shift. And we are now at the point of having the tech to start our pilots and then hopefully scale that in terms of our B2B solution. And do you have any clients now that you've kind of continuously had from that stage? So I know you worked with Beyond Retro, is that right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so we we did some, again, there's like lots of testing with that. So that was testing around like tailoring secondhand clothing and it was just in-store partnership. We obviously partnered with Ganny. Those have continued. The What we're doing now, though, kind of like when we took the break post-fundraise is very much like tested, figured things out somewhat clean slate let's do the right thing um take all the learnings create the right product funnel also so one thing worth saying is probably that also wanted to do a million different things at different times so doing the dtc app doing beyond retro in store with secondhand clothing doing gani mid-market online e-commerce and actually just realizing that getting one thing really really right um in the end obviously we like to be for everyone in many different ways but you're in store online at your own home with your own wardrobe Sojo will be there for you to tailor and repair, but actually realizing that again, especially as a team of two, yeah. we really should just be focusing on one thing um, and trying to get that as right as we possibly can and do it in the right way. And that kind of not fearing focus was really crucial. Yeah, no, I think that's so, so important. This whole idea of like do less better mm. and just like focus. Mm. And it's like, of course, we mm. can see all of these different marketplaces that we'd be amazing in. For me, for example, it's like men's or like really quick international expansion or all of these things. Yeah. And it's like, 
of course it would work. <laughs> that does not mean it is the right thing to do yeah. right now. Mm -hmm. And that is, I don't know about you, but that's one of the things I struggle with the most because I understand that it's so important. Mm. But I also, one thing about me, if there's an opportunity, I'm going to take it. And really being able to kind of like pull that back and teach myself to just be like, no, no, mm. you can have it, <laughs> but do not throw it down, <laughs> you stupid idiot. Um, funding. Yeah. When you originally realised you wanted to raise funding, mm. what did you have in your mind as kind of like what the funding round would look like? Interesting. I knew that we wanted to create an sort of incredible roster of investors around us. Um, what that looks like, knew it would be a mix of venture capital and angel, knew that we were ready to really ramp things up and create a sort of bigger round. Um, but then it was all to play for. You go out into the market and it is, I don't want to say it is what it is again. <laughs> it is what it is again, I don't want to say that. Go out into the market and um, <laughs> all I'm thinking of is it is what it is. <laughs> you can just say that. No, I don't, I don't want to say it. So you go out into the market and it will be what it will be. <laughs> you did that so well. Thank you. <laughs> I love the remix. Um, and how did you get your intros to your first funds yep. and people that you talked to? Yep. So this is massively, massively, massively crucial, which was building those investor relationships from the beginning. Not mm. from the beginning, because actually a lot of them happen really naturally. But from our angel round, the investor relationships with, as you were saying, with the networking, like really had people around me who wanted to champion and it's sad it's really sad but those warm intros are everything and when you get people who back you enough as an individual because you've been chatting to them for months and they've been helping you and you've built a really good relationship you've gone for dinners with them when they do an intro as an investor to another investor and they say you've got to meet one of the most incredible founders i've ever met you are set up in that new call to potentially get investment after 20 minutes because the way they view you and that shape and the, the backing that you have from that person and the way they framed who you are, mm. I wouldn't have been able to do it without them. I wouldn't have been able to do it with the cold interest, especially as how quickly we did it. It was really fast. And like all of that was really reliant on people doing intros, supporting me and wanting to back what we were building. And I love that you did that. And I love the fact that you you know, nurtured these relationships to get you to a point that that was something that you could kind of, obviously it wouldn't have been easy anyway, um, but you'd kind of have these warm intros and everything. But in the same way as, you know, I completely agree and found myself very much in the same position and those warm intros were really, really, really mm, helpful. So sad, yeah. How do we change the landscape then that for people who aren't living in a major city or, mm. you know, necessarily you know you don't know people until you know people mm. and all of these things and like how how do we kind of help to change or start skew skewing that landscape to mean that people have better contacts or that it's a less of a contacts based game because we all know that people are investing based on what they know and what they think is successful and mm. that's usually who they know and all of these mm. different things i think probably it's less about i mean in an ideal world will change the game and it's not about contact and that it's all completely it's all completely democratized but i think the stepping stone to that is purely about the investors that are in the game so mm -hmm. ultimately if you are a fund and you don't just have seven white men who are based in london who came from middle class background you're then immediately diversifying the founders who come so like whether we're speaking about gender or we're speaking about race or we're speaking about socioeconomic background if you are diversifying the investors who have the capital you'll don't you'll diversify the founders who get mm -hmm. the capital. Um, so ultimately, I think it's fantastic if I'm joining, and I honestly, this is, I don't know how this is going to come across, but if I join an investor call and the investor who's sitting across from me is a black woman who's a scouser, I'll be like, oh, damn, like, this is yeah. crazy, what? Because um, you just don't hear northern accents for example in the startup landscape when i was fundraising and like i really think that representation from yes the rest of england from different backgrounds from different races genders sexualities it's not represented in mm -hmm. the investment landscape at all so that's why it's not representing the founders because everyone loves investing in themselves <laughs> yeah exactly and so like what we can, i think there are a few different things that we put uh, first of all i think it goes without saying it's not on us to change mm. and i think that women especially do a lot of the work in terms of changing the landscape by being super generous with contacts, super generous with intros. Like I'll meet someone within a second and be like, oh, I'll intro you to these 17 people <laughs> who I hope will be able to help. Yeah. But but I th think we kind of do a lot of work with that. But I also think that two of the things that we, that we can do really well are that being generous mm. and being as generous as possible mm. uh, in terms of intros and in terms of sharing contacts and in terms of, you know, even talking about it and sharing information mm. um, to be able to raise things. Um, and also then 
the biggest, biggest thing that could be changed is exactly that investors just having more diverse ICs, mm. investment committees, mm. and just more diverse people in their fund. Yeah. Because when they sit there saying, oh yeah, no, no, we're really looking to back more diverse founders. And it's like the fact you're even having to go out and look for this shows mm. how much your network is mm. probably white men from Oxbridge. Mm. And, and also s- you're stopping those diverse founders from joining you, from even being backed by you, because they also don't want to be backed by you. Yeah. Like I literally it's a vicious cycle as well because like I and I had this like weeks ago where I went into one of our um went to one of our funds who did a small ticket went to an event they had and I was just like mm, because I arrived and it's 30 people and 28 of them are guys and I was like wow I actually don't want to come into spaces mm. like this like I'm so used to going to like stack world events and just being around all these amazing women mm. I was like hmm, I don't really enjoy this and like I was just really disappointed and it's kind of it's kind of them understanding that they have to make deep, very strong, very fervent sort of changes to get then that deal flow or to get people to actually see that they are making the changes for them, for them to just talk about it mm. and not to get two black partners in as part of the fund who are then deploying the capital where you can feel seen and you can feel safe. Then they're not making enough moves. Like give the people, give the sort of black people, the women, the partners, give them money so they can deploy it themselves. And then the founders will see themselves in those sort of investors and want to be a part of it. At the same time, don't want to emphasize that it's the responsibility of a woman or black person or any sort of minority or underrepresented investor to then only invest in that silo as well. It's just all yeah. problematic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a, it's, it's a cycle and there are areas of the cycle that need to be tweaked a little bit mm, to be yeah, able to encourage again. this change and it will have like wider changes because mm. currently it's a self-perpetuating white male cycle. Mm. I'd also really quickly like to say, only because I didn't touch on it when I was speaking about my fundraise, which was um, as much as I got those fantastic intros... Jesus, the fundraise was... Oh my God, yeah, yeah, no. I think <laughs> Horrifically that's, hard. I think that's what people... <laughs> and everyone said no. <laughs> yeah, and I think people think that you t- when you yeah. talk about, oh, I got warm intros or I got contacts or any of this, we're talking about people putting their money into a business. Like, I, we had three months of due diligence. Mm. So it's like, it's... An intro is going to do great things and they're really important, but also don't want anyone to think that if you know people you know people <laughs> I like I feel like especially like having gone to the schools I went to and like having gone to Oxford mm. I'm sure there were many people I could re- like you know it mm. would be like wouldn't have been a reach to be like hello <laughs> I saw your pictures of your very big country house and I was wondering if your parents would yeah. like to speak to me <laughs> um but you know it's it's there's so much of a move from then in terms of actually getting the investment. No one, I don't think anyone would think that you kind of got those warm intros and then people were just like, yes, no, hundreds of no, thousands There was of uh, plenty of rejection. Yes. And it, uh, and it hits your soul. It really Because like does. you are the business and the business is you. You're like me, Sojo, the same thing. Um, and then like they're rejecting Sojo, but they're rejecting you. And it's so emotionally taxing. It was really just like nothing like I'd prepared for or thought it would be and the no after no after no after no it's really whew, it's difficult and ultimately the lead investor for our round is a female founded fund um and that says something so even when people will see the headline and be like fantastic raise a couple of million like still it still wasn't those white men backing me i mean ultimately mm. we do have some white guys amazing yeah. white investors on our cap table but Still, it had to be a female-founded fund to be the one to be like, yeah, solo, female founder, young, mixed race, like, we're going to back you. And that's still very important to note as well. But it was like, even though raised a fantastic amount, we're still, our, our sort of investors are incredibly diverse. And that's necessary because the other people might not have given me the money, which they didn't. <laughs> and how did you start writing a pitch deck? How did you start doing a model if you did one? How did it, <laughs> how did it come about? How did you learn how to do it? And how did you get it kind of together to be able to start pitching? Yeah, I think um, researching, like massively researching, went to, ages ago actually went to a fantastic event by The Stack that was talking about creating a bang and pitch deck or something, pitch deck 101 or something great. You just start like reading and learning, um, but ultimately whatever pitch deck I created and actually that found this really difficult with Sojo is like, there are lots of different directions we could have gone with the narrative, right. um, whether that's about fashion waste or whether it's about fashion fit or whether it's about the direct to consumer or the B2B. There was just like so many, so it was really hard to refine, um, but basically did a session with two of our investors 
um, with two of our investors who really are just like massively helpful to me and have been supporting me from a very early stage. And we started the call to like refine the pitch deck and 11 hours later, we were still on the call <laughs> because we'd just been going and going and going and going. I, I know, amazing. I, I don't even, I literally don't even think we ate. And I remember being like, what have we done? Like it was actually crazy from the morning to the evening, such an intense pitch deck call. And by the end it was, um, it was banging. And that's one thing that I would say as well is, Pitch deck, again, it's what can you have control over going into this fundraise? You can't control how people view you as a demographic. You can control how you pitch and how well you answer questions. Mm -hmm. You can control the deck. All I wanted was to have a deck where at the end of it, I felt like as I looked through it, I want people to feel like, take my money. Yeah. And don't sell it for less. Kind of like that. If it's not hell yes, if it's a no, looking for 10 out of 10 killers for hiring, your deck you have control, make it the best thing you possibly can. And I think when I finished the deck with these investors and we used a deck designer as well, I was just excited to send it out to get people looking at it. And that's how you have to feel. Like this is a no brainer. Market, time, like timing, the traction, the B2B partners in the pipeline, you know, me. Yeah. <laughs> it kind of was just like, it's, a, it's surely a no brainer. I mean, we still got no's, but yeah, it was a great deck. Yeah, and it also, because there are always going to be people who don't understand. Mm. Like, there were always people who we talked to and they were like, how about using a lower proportion of sustainable fabric? <laughs> or how about shouting about it this much? And it's like, mm. no, mm. no, like, you don't get it. That's yeah. fine. Mm. And actually, obviously, it's a huge luxury to be able to, like, choose based on what works as well. And, like, it's not even necessarily that they would have said yes. Like, we, you know, it, it's always, there are always going to be rejections and it's always very much part of the process. But actually, it's almost better if you were able to whittle everyone down mm. and then kind of get to a point where you're like actually do you know what you get it and you'll also understand that there are going to be obstacles and that's fine and we're changing our whole industry here so like let's get down to work but we can see the idea we can see the vision um and if you were to do it all over again what would you tell yourself at the beginning of the funding round Whew, i mean uh wow because i really was like at least i'm going to be a million times better next time but then i'm like Will I? Will it be just as chaotic? I think what I tell myself is, Grace, I don't know. <laughs> wow, this is crazy, careful. What would I tell myself? Um, I don't know. It ended up being fine in the end and we did it quite quickly. I'm trying to be like, what would I do different? I'm really stumped on this one. Mm. Mine would be yeah. that I would, you know when you have to be able to be fine even when things are not fine mm. and I think that funding rounds are it was the most grueling thing I've ever been through in my life yeah. like without a doubt um and you have you cannot wait for things to be okay to be able to be like happy to still like laugh to look after yourself all of these things and for me I know that if I go through a funding round again it's just like these next few months are literally blocked out for mm. me to die <laughs> but I will get through it and it will be yeah. fine. And I need to still be able to find time to laugh with my friends, to all of this. And of course, the large majority of the time, you're going to be in a room, you're going to be pitching, you're going to be working on your deck, you're going to be working out things that you never even thought you'd have to think about, all of these different things. But actually, you have to be fine. You have to be able to be okay within a period of time that's not okay, mm. if that makes sense. Yeah. It's like knowing that you're just in the fucking trenches and you're just like, I will, like one foot in front of the other, don't think about it too much, the time will pass and it will be fine or it won't be fine. And that's fine. <laughs> yes, I'm so here for that. No, I'm gonna absolutely take exactly what you've just said um, and repeat it. <laughs> right, but basically perfect. perspective has changed everything for me. And I think that, well, telling myself previously, like oh, I got into therapy as part of the fundraise and as part of it was fundraise plus a breakup and like I really needed therapy um but this time I'd like do it beforehand and make sure I'm like in a really great place mentally as much as I possibly mm. can be but I think perspective in the ter in terms of going into the meeting and deeply understanding that this is an investment opportunity for you yeah like, that's what that, that is, this so is like, true. not going in and being like I need your money and I'm asking for your money it's being like I know what we're building I know where we're gonna go I know the impact we're gonna have and I know how much money it's gonna make do you want to be there at this early stage and have a fantastic opportunity that you took, that you took, you know, I really think going in and feeling like this is something that is good for you. I mean, it's pretty arrogant, but like this is an it's incredible investment opportunity. Because it's also, I think it's a very, dare I say it, I think it's a very male way of thinking. Yeah. And I think that actually, mm. ultimately, the mm. people are sitting in rooms with 
hundreds of millions to deploy every year, <laughs> that their job is that they have to spend that money. In the same way as if I gave someone a marketing budget of 20,000 for influencer marketing, if they don't spend that, I'm not happy. You have to spend the money. Yeah. The reason you're spending the money is to make more money, right? And so sitting there thinking, being like, please, mummy, can I have that money for this business? <laughs> it's not, that's not it. You're deciding whether you want to put the money that you have to deploy as part of your job into this business and take a gamble on it working. And these are all the reasons I'm telling you why it's going to work. Mm. Now, that's not saying that you shouldn't be able to sit down with investors, especially further along the process um, before you close the round and say, do you know what? Yeah, there might be an issue with this, but mm. this is how we foresee a dealing with it. One thing we haven't quite cracked is this. It's not about arrogance. It's about the fact that the it's not charity. No. They're not putting money into your business to do to do good. Yeah. Ultimately, it's to be able to make it into more money and giving someone the opportunity to jump on the idea that you're going to do all the hard work to make happen. They just need to put the money in, I think is such an important mm. thing. And I'm so glad you brought that up. I remember one time sending a message to my uh, to Tala's managing partner during the round and just being like, oh my God, I can't, like, I'm just like so grateful. And she replied, she was like, obviously this is great. <laughs> but she was like, you've got to remember as well, Grace, you're letting people give mm. you, like, mm. you're letting them give you money mm. to work really fucking hard yeah. to make their money into far more money. Yeah. And you have to remember that yeah. they should be thanking you. And it's so true because when I then invest in businesses that I think are gonna do really well, I'm like, thank you so much for asking me. <laughs> I'm like, I'd love to put my money in here, it is. And yeah. it's like, it is exactly that. We both think we're doing each other a favor and it's not about arrogance, but it's actually about the fact that you're about to work really fucking hard mm. to make someone's money into more money. So it's not all about, it's not, it's not Peggy, it's not charity. You're not asking them for money mm. so that you can have a little play with it. Of course, it's a huge opportunity. And of course, it's really exciting. And of course, amazing. You know, I'm so grateful to our investors and all of this. But remembering it's not charity and you're, uh, you're giving someone an opportunity to be part of something amazing, I think mm. is so important. And I think there's that, so it's that mental attitude, it's that mental strength that comes pre-fundraise that I think I really would refine and really make sure you are so in that right state because I think that's where the stamina of like what the fundraise ends up being or the you know hundred meetings that you have you have to really you have to be in a really strong place mentally when it comes to perspective when it comes to attitude um, and I think that would end up being game changing for the whole process and or maybe your business in general um, but I remember yeah, I just remember even like pre fundraise, like pre the meetings, like the one thing that would like send to me and like I should next time I'll be thinking about how it's an investment opportunity things. But I really all I would, I mean, it's actually a bit, it's a bit cheesy, um, but like because my dad's been such an inspiration to me and things, I'd be like, I'd always just be like, like, remember whose daughter you are. And like, it's just just like it's like sat at game time, like, come on, you know, yeah, you know, and you go in with a different vibe and a different attitude and you kind of play around a bit more and you're less stressed and I think not arrogance but confidence really crucial you mentioned it's a masculine trait that kind of concept I think that's why they're probably there secure in the bag like it's really that kind of approach and that kind of attitude game changing I think when you go in with that it shifts the dynamic entirely um and it means that it's yeah it's not kind of a begging situation <laughs> yeah and one thing I also that just came to mind when you said that is also in I encourage it with my friends with job interviews too. Once you have, obviously not if you're in an entry level job, sitting there and being like, <laughs> well, would you like me? I'll me. consider giving you the opportunity. But when you have experience, just understanding that it is a two way interview, they are, I, I'm always aware of this. When I'm interviewing someone for a final stage, especially when it's got a bit of experience, it is 100% a hundred percent a two way interview. And it Selling gets more and more mm. the most, you know, the higher you go up the hierarchy, but actually understanding that if you're going for a job interview and you have some experience and you know you're good or you're gonna work hard, you're also giving that company the opportunity to work with you. And that confidence in, and that, as we said, is quite a male trait and is mm. taught, I believe, to males. Yeah. To males, males. As if they're the animals, well, as if they don't call us females. Um, but is is very important in being able to just, even if you're kind of faking it, but just being like, you need someone in this role. Mm. I am interested in this role. This is not a one-way thing here. Coming in with the confidence of just being like, I'm also giving you the opportunity to work with me as much as you're giving me the opportunity to work at your company. I think it's so important. And that's me saying it as someone who's hiring people. So someone will probably listen to this and then come and be like, why? <laughs> 
I do not be. <laughs> but I think that, um, yeah, I think that is so important. I think it's often forgotten because we give corporations and this kind of like hierarchical whatever so much power in our heads. Um, but I think that's a really good place to end. Mm. Thank you so much for coming on. It's been amazing to yeah. have you here. Um, it's been incredible. As I said, I don't really do podcasts, but I'm obsessed with you and you're one of our investors, so I can have to be. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, it's been amazing chatting to you and yeah, you're such an inspiration. I don't know, we didn't say that, you know, when I met you years, I say that a couple of years ago, do you remember that? I came up to Grace like, and was like, oh, you're such an inspiration. And then years later, here we are. Here we are. Yeah. And that's how it works. <laughs> and we will continue Full circle. the cycle. And it will, mm. one day you're going to be, you're going to see Sojo on every single checkout page. Mm -hmm. And it's going to change your life and your jeans and uh, your entire wardrobe. <laughs> <laughs>